uh, it's just such an honor to uh, uh, introduce both of, of these individuals. Uh, Dr. Gordon Sachs uh, is the executive director of the Krupp Center for Integrative Research, a preventive and integrative medicine physician, a nutrition epidemiologist, a founding member of the UC San Diego Centers for Integrative Health, and a national leader in the food as medicine movement. He currently serves as the FDA sponsor investigator of the Mach 19 mushroom and Chinese herbs for COVID-19 studies, and also oversees about 20 clinical trials examining the role of diet, and natural uh, products, and a range of health conditions. His prior research focused on diet and cancers of the prostate, breast, and pancreas. He received his MD from Michigan State University, his PhD in epidemiology from University of Michigan, go blue, and MPH in nutrition from Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Um, his co-presenter is Dr. Paul Stamets, um, speaker, author, mycologist, medical researcher, and entrepreneur. He's considered an intellectual and industry leader in fungi, habitat, medicinal use, and production. He lectures extensively to deepen the understanding and respect for the organisms that literally exist under every footstep taken on this path of life. His presentations cover a range of mushroom species and research showing how mushrooms can help the health of people and planet. His central premise is that habitats have immune systems, just like people, and mushrooms are cellular bridges between the two. Our close evolutionary relationship to fungi can be the basis for novel pairings in the microbiome that lead to greater sustainability and immune enhancement. Paul Stamets is the author of seven books, including Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms, and Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World. He's discovered and named numerous new species of psilocybin mushrooms and is the founder and owner of Fungi Perfecti, makers of the host defense mushroom supplement line. He is an invention ambassador for the American Association for the Advancement of Science and was inducted into the Explorers Club in 2020. He's received numerous awards, including the National Mycologist Award from the North American Myco Mycological Association, the Gordon and Tina Wasson Award from the Mycological Society of America, and the Disruptor Award from NexMed. He has named four new species of psilocybin mushrooms. In 2023, a new psilocybin mushroom species was named after him to honor his lifelong work, Psilocybe uh, stemetsii. He's a dedicated earthling, knowledge keeper, and is a leader in protection of ecosystems, focusing on the roles of mycelium and mushrooms. Paul's philosophy is that mycodiversity is biosecurity. Paul funds research to save rare strains of mushrooms that dwell within the old growth forests. He sees the ancient old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest as a resource of incalculable value, especially in terms of its fungal genome. His culture collection consists of hundreds of mushroom strains, including nearly 100 strains of agaricon, sourced primarily from the old growth forests. He believes the old growth forests contain a deep reservoir of species essential for pandemic defense. He is a collaborator with numerous scientific organizations and research institutes. His research is considered breakthrough by thought leaders for creating a paradigm shift for helping ecosystems worldwide. In addition, his work has entered the mainstream of popular culture. In the new Star, Star Trek Discovery series on CBS, the science officer is portrayed by an astromycologist, Lieutenant Commander Paul Stamets, whose concepts became a central theme of this science fiction. His work with mycelium has become a central theme of this series. He served as the primary guide to the mushroom documentary, Fantastic Fungi, which first appeared in theaters in fall 2019 and currently on Netflix with a 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce both of these gentlemen. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today. We know you have lots of choices of where to spend your time, and we've all been really anxious and excited to hear from you both. And actually, there's there's now a third. We have well, uh, addition of Stephen Wilson, uh, who I will jump in and introduce. Stephen Wilson, PhD, is the Executive Director and CEO of Foundation Immune Engineering, Associate Clinical Professor at the University of California, San Diego, former CEO of La Hala Institute for Immunology, and a trained mechanistic and translational immunologist. He currently serves as advisor on the Mach 19, or Mushroom and Chinese Herbs for COVID-19 Studies. His prior research focused on infectious disease and rapid diagnostics. Uh, he was a 2021 X Prize winner. He, uh, as well as oncology diagnostics, autoimmune disease, and global scale immuno, Im, immunoinformatics, where he's the co PI of NIH's immune epitope database. He received his PhD in medicine from the University of Arizona, which does seem to be a bit of a trend for today. So, with that, we will turn it over to you, Dr. Saxon, Dr. Wilson. Thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, can you hear me okay? 
Sounds good. Great. So uh, uh, the title of the presentation, Mushrooms, is COVID Vaccine Adjuvants and Immune Modulators. So I want to bring us all back to a point that we might prefer to forget in early 2020, when suddenly COVID was upon the land. And uh, it was a kind of a scary and, and uh, difficult moment for large numbers of people and a huge abrupt uh, shift in society. At the time, those of us in the integrative medicine community needed to, uh, as, as in other communities, needed to uh, quickly apply everything we knew. It was an all hands on deck moment. So we were contemplating how could integrative medicine help? One of the ways was to uh, was to bring diet and lifestyle modification that we work with other clients, other patients on, to reduce risk factors for COVID morbidity and mortality, diabetes, uh, hypertension, heart disease, and so forth. Obesity were all considered risk factors for uh, more severe expression and higher mortality from acute COVID infection. We also wanted to look and see whether there were natural therapeutics, herbs. Uh, uh, dietary products, uh, other supplements that might be of help for patients suffering acutely from infection. This is before uh, any of the, the, the newer treatments had come online. Another area was we wanted to see whether using uh, natural products or other things, we could en enhance the overall immunity of individuals. Later on, uh, we also considered how could we modify the effectiveness of COVID vaccines? And most of what I want to talk about uh, in my part of this presentation will focus on that. And then finally, as it became more and more obvious to us that people were suffering from this strange uh, post-acute uh, COVID uh, condition, long COVID, we wanted to bring the tools of integrative medicine uh, to bear to help foster recovery and wellness in long COVID. As we considered these, I had already uh, been studying a bit about medicinal mushrooms, and I knew about their immune potentiating and antimicrobial factors. Uh, I was also a fan of Paul Stamitz's work and was um, absolutely floored when I saw his TED Talk, Six Ways That Mushrooms Can Save the World. Uh, and as I dug more deeply into this, I could see that in particular, a couple of mushrooms Fomatopsis officinalis, also known as agaricon, and Trimetes versicolor, also known as turkey tail, had a, had a great deal of evidence suggesting their antimicrobial, antiviral, and, um, and immune potentiating benefits specifically. So I had also learned from colleagues at UCLA Center for East-West Medicine, who are also uh, trying to find a way to help COVID, that they had stumbled across or heard about an herbal formula that was used in the early days in Wuhan, in China, called Xingfei Pai Du Tong, or QFPD. And uh, note that um, the, the product that I had mentioned, or the, the, the pair FOTV, Fomatopsis officinalis, combined with TV, Tramides versicolor, is the combination of agaricon and turkey tail. So uh, meanwhile, our colleagues at UCLA had uh, grown very interested in the use of Xingfei Pai Du Tong, the 21 herb formula developed on the fly in Wuhan. Uh, it had elements that had been used in over 300 recorded epidemics in over 2000 years of Chinese medicine history. And in the early days, it se seemed to show promise for both healthcare workers and patients in Wuhan. So we joined up our forces and we created the Mach 19 studies. This is mushrooms and Chinese herbs for COVID-19. And at this about the same time, we were learning about Operation Warp Speed, the quest to develop on the fly quickly um, a, a, a vaccine for COVID using mRNA technology. Now that's driven by large pharmaceutical companies. We're mom and pop natural medicine folks, so we can't operate at light speed, but Mach 19 we figured is pretty darn fast. And we were in a hurry. So we developed a multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled set of studies, set of clinical trials um, of medicinal mushrooms and Chinese herbs for COVID-19. We, our colleagues at UCLA, and others. Uh, this is a just a list of the folks who are on our immediate research team. So we had the, the core group at UC San Diego, colleagues at UCLA, particularly Andrew Shubov, who is lead investigator and the site PI for uh, the UCLA group. 
also colleagues at Cornell and and uh, and at the lab for fungi perfecti. I want to have a, just list a few acknowledgments. The primary uh, supporter of this work was the Krupp Endowed Fund at UCSD. Um, in addition, I want to give a shout out to Lee Stein, who was uh, who played a really critical role in the early days of this project. Uh, his enthusiasm, his support, his help in networking, helping to navigate some of the politics of conducting these kinds of trials was instrumental. So the Mach 19 uh, studies consisted initially of studies one and two, which were randomized clinical trials of FOTV, a Garakon and turkey tail in combination, and Xingfei Paidutong, the Chinese herbal formula, QFPD, for treatment of acute COVID infection. Our questions at that time were, are first, um, FOTV and second, QFPD, safe and effective in the treatment of mild to moderate COVID? So we realized very quickly that we were going to need to apply to the Food and Drug Administration if we wanted these to be accepted, ultimately proven and accepted and uh, as treatments for acute COVID. So when we did that, we were told by the FDA that in order to satisfy all uh, concerns, we needed to first conduct a sentinel study to examine the effect of mushrooms on the process of cytokine storm. Early in the pandemic, there was a concern that because mushrooms are immunopotentiating and because cytokine storm is a signal event that was identified that marked the abrupt uh, transition from a mild a localized illness to a rapidly um, progressive, virulent systemic disease uh, that we did not want to use anything that could potentially aggravate or accelerate that process. And so we had to satisfy them that indeed that was uh, there was no concern about mushrooms. In early 2021, we completed our Sentinel study and the FDA then approved both um, FOTV and Xingfei or QFPD as quote unquote investigational new drugs for safety testing in phase one clinical trials in acute COVID. This is no small thing. Very, very few natural products make it to the point of FDA approval for phase one trials. Uh, so we're, we're, we're very gratified that we were able to accomplish this, but there's more. Studies one and two began in early 2021, and study one had a sample size of 54 and study two, 60. Now, from this point on, I'm going to only be focusing on <clears throat> the Sentinel study and the then study three, which I'll describe in a moment. The Sentinel study, here's our here are our uh, data from that, basically looked at the first set of subjects, and we were asked to make sure that there was no increase in viral load, an indicator of potential acceleration of the disease during the first couple of weeks. So we took multiple samples from these individuals, um, measured their uh, viral load, change in that of individuals who were diagnosed with acute COVID. We found that there was no evidence of cytokine storm. The uh, FDA agreed and approved us for the larger studies. Um, and then in one of those larger studies, the study one, the study of the mushrooms for disease for acute COVID, um, we found no indication of any subject in the study having cytokine storm being triggered, no, no problem. If anything, it appeared to decrease symptoms of acute COVID. We'll have more to say about that when we set, submit for publication shortly. On to study three. This is the main focus for right now. This, is a, this was a randomized clinical trial of, of Agaricon and turkey tail, FOTV, as a COVID vaccine adjuvant. And while we were waiting for everything to move forward with our, our own IRB, the Drug Enforcement Administration, which had a say in the Chinese herbs, the Food and Drug Administration, a litany of agencies we had to navigate, I was giving a lot of thought to the question of, well, these vaccines are going to be coming out. How effective are they really going to be? The common cold, a coronavirus, had never had a proper vaccine that was long lasting. And I, was, I had also uh, done some research into the use of mushrooms and other natural products as vaccine adjuvants for other vaccines, not COVID. And there's a history of their use in animals um, possibly serving as a natural adjuvant that can non-specifically enhance the effectiveness of vaccines. So I thought the FOTV that we were using in study one was a logical candidate to use in this setting as well. Our questions when we undertook this were, were will it be safe? 
for use in this context? Will it increase the peak retin, um, receptor binding domain protein? That's the key uh, antibody. Uh, 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 that's the key. Re that's the key protein uh, for which the mRNA vaccines targeted their antibody production. And we wanted to see: can we increase the level of those antibodies? Also, since the effectiveness of vaccines goes down over time, marked by a decline in those antibody levels, could we slow the rate of that decline? By administration of mushrooms. And finally, we wanted to see, since we knew that mushrooms are immunomodulatory, could they also help tamp down short-term vaccine side effects? That study began in May 21. We recruited and randomized 90 subjects. I'm not going to dwell on this. This is a study timeline. Uh, and then here are our baseline demographic and patient characteristic data. Uh, nothing showed up except for age, uh, as a slightly differential uh, level in the FOTV versus placebo groups as a result of this. There's reasons why that, that occurred that um, I, I don't have time to get into right now. But as a result of that, we age adjusted our data uh, uh, so that we could take the effective age out of the, uh, effect, in, out of the effect. Um, and so here's, um, here are the findings that we had for safety. Uh, we looked primarily at liver and renal function and also adverse events. There were no adverse events in, in the group. And, um, and we saw no negative impact at all on, um, on either liver or renal function. We then looked at the, the efficacy. Um, would the vaccines, uh, when, when with, with the addition of uh, four days of use of FOTV at the very beginning, could that enhance the effectiveness? Well, here we're looking at all exposure groups. This incorporates both individuals who had previously been exposed to COVID and had some antibodies. We didn't know at the start um, whether people were had prior had had prior exposure or not. Many people in the population had. Some had not, had un, undergone prior vaccines, and we were getting them for at a booster level. And those individuals had um, vaccine immunity. And then a third group, roughly a third of the population had no prior exposure to COVID, either natural infection or from vaccine. In that group, the COVID naive group, here's where the relationship really started to be visible. Um, after uh, at 28 days, roughly one month after completion of vaccination, we saw both the subjects and the controls, the, vac the um, mushroom group and the placebo group hit their initial peak. From that point, the the, uh, the placebo group, like all other groups, started to decline, and we measured them out to six months, and the levels had gone down. Interestingly, they continued to go up in the mushroom group, and the peak wasn't wasn't. We don't even know whether we hit the peak. If we had followed them beyond six months, it may have gone up even further, but it would continue to go up when it should have gone down. We then looked at side effects again, looking at that group. That was um, that was COVID naive that had not been prior, had had prior exposure, which might have sensitized them to have a differential response. In that group, we looked at a number of different classic side effects associated with vaccine, short-term side effects over the one, two, three, four, five days from vaccination, and we saw that chills were significantly worse in the um, in the vac in the um, uh, placebo group than in the mushrooms. Um, mushrooms also were associated with lower problem with muscle aches, and then um, other and and when we look, we saw a signi quite significant uh, effect of the mushrooms in reducing all short term side effects. So, just to summarize, FOTV appears the mushrooms appear to be safe as they as we use them in this study. Four days of use. Uh, uh, 12 grams, six of turkey tail, six of agaricon per day in divided doses um, as a COVID-19 COVID mRNA vaccine adjuvant. In the COVID-naive subjects, further, we also saw an increased peak level of um, the key RBD, uh, the, the key uh, receptor binding domain on the spike protein. We saw an increased peak level of that. We saw a decrease uh, uh, or rather a prevention of the normal decline in the antibodies um, after 28 days, a reduction in short-term vaccine-related side effects, and, and, a, uh, and, and then when we looked at these two things together, 
we saw a decrease in vaccine reactogenicity, meaning the side effects, without compromising the immunogenicity. Usually when you set a vaccine so that it has fewer side effects, it's gonna be less effective. In this case, there was no compromise of the effectiveness and possibly there was an actual improvement in the effectiveness. So few things for the limited sample size, it's very important to realize these findings must be interpreted. Some of these findings are the result of outliers, um, and um, and so uh, we're not sure, um, we can't be 100% certain that that, uh, and, and we'll do more analyses to be. Um, study three was popular, easy to recruit for. Subjects were highly motivated. The intervention was pretty simple. Taking capsules of mushrooms for four days, having a few blood draws, brief questionnaires to complete, and some phone calls from our staff. Uh, clinical data like these are rare. Um, I don't know anybody who was able to jump into the fray the way we were able to, and we were very fortunate because we were already fully funded by the Krupp Endowment and others. We were already mobilized from studies one and two. We were we we were nimble. Our group is you know relatively uh, nimble, and we were able to recognize the research opportunity in front of us and to act on it at just the right time. Another thought is that COVID kind of offered a dry run to help us study the potential of mushrooms, perhaps for the next pandemic. Could it be an arsenal, could it be a tool in the toolkit, uh, a quiver in the arrow? A few other thoughts, the use of medicinal polypore mushrooms with vaccines may constitute a natural safe strategy that is truly integrated in every sense of the world at, at the molecular level that conveys the broad wisdom of the forest to the human immune system and modulates its activity to optimize the effects of vaccines. This strategy could lend itself to uh, vaccines for other infectious diseases, or uh, could be used in conjunction with um, monoclonal antibodies, immunotherapies, or other biologicals for cancer or other chronic diseases. Same principles may apply. Either way, we think further research, testing these and other mushrooms or fungus is needed and warranted. Now, this, of course, requires the, the uh, a pay level higher than mine, the, the brain of a really smart immunologist. And fortunately, it just so happens that we had one in our group. So I leave it now to my colleague, Stephen Wilson, to uh, take over from this point. Thanks, Gordon. I'm going to share uh, my screen here. And I'm going to stop sharing. Great. So Gordon, thank you. And, and also, I need to thank the speakers that came before our section. They set this up uh, uh, remarkably well, even though I didn't know it was coming. But the discussion of trained immunity uh, and the idea that there is a stage upon which vaccination happens, as well as uh, response to infection, is, is key. Um, uh, as Gordon mentioned, we went into the study uh, taking all comers. And what we were really trying to do is, is look at risk benefits. And uh, I'm going to play the, the, the role of the uh, mechanistic immunologist for a bit, because this is a devilish problem in vaccinology, but just in general, in thinking about adjunctive therapies, uh, if you're trying to both uh, improve the immune response, uh, but keep the, the, the therapy itself as not only tolerable, but, but safe. And so when you when you think about uh, approved vaccines, I made a little pictograph here uh, that uh, every vaccine, uh, when given broadly, has to be extremely safe. It also has to be effective, and that's uh, immunogenicity, the, the amount of neutralizing antibodies and, and other protective mechanisms. And uh, you can live with very little side effects, and reactogenicity is uh, largely due to uh, the immune system activating. And there are theories out there as to whether or not you can unlink this, if, if it's actually just something that is part and parcel to an immune response. Uh, I also put uh, the COVID, this is a subjective uh, ranking, um, but COVID, COVID vaccines, mRNA vaccines, actually are have a, frequent, a high frequency of some kind of uh, vaccine-related soreness, headaches, certainly nothing that would uh, create a, a risk benefit ratio against using the vaccine. Uh, but it's not to say that there uh, aren't some side effects. And this is important because if we can unlink the side effects associated with vaccination, 
uh, we can not only improve safety, but we can reduce hesitancy. Uh, and that's a that's a big component if we think about um, using vaccines in an ever-changing viral uh, threat environment, but they need to be durable as well. Uh, and the durability is how long are those gonna last? Uh, and then uh, efficacy is, is pretty much the whole thing uh, put together. And, and so uh, in interest of keeping to time, I'm gonna go fairly quickly, but in the discussion, I hope that we come back to, discuss, uh, to, to get into some of these uh, refinement questions. But one I noticed in the chat, and I'll, I'll state it now, um, uh, the dosing used um, mycelium. And so uh, as you're thinking about the effects and what we're thinking about in terms of uh, the immune mechanisms, uh, consider that as a part of it after we've heard a really good primer on, on beta-glucans. So as Gordon uh, stated, there were there were some interesting findings at the high level. And given the uh, limited number of enrollees, we have large error bars. Uh, but nonetheless, there were uh, three big areas that I want to uh, cover in, in my section here. And that is uh, the, the first off that it doesn't interfere with uh, COVID-2 vaccines insofar as the amount of antibodies and the dynamics of uh, response to the vaccine. Uh, the second is in a particular cohort, those who uh, through molecular testing did not have any experience previously with a vaccine or uh, COVID-2 despite the pandemic, um, they had uh, a plateau that we couldn't measure. We only went out six months. And at that point, uh, as you can see on the graph, it was still going up, but uh, certainly it was different than uh, those who were in the placebo group. And then finally, uh, the symptomology. And so th this is a measure of uh, reactogenicity. And uh, in the placebo group, uh, theirs was markedly higher. Again, overlapping error bars because of the small size. Uh, but I'm gonna get into all three cases. So uh, in the study, we were able to actually take a look at uh, uh, treatment in the context of those people who were going to undergo a, a primary response. In other words, they had no uh, previous exposure, and therefore you'd be starting from a low number of uh, potential progenitor cells and, and building up. And then two groups that are essentially being boosted when they receive their uh, vaccines. Uh, one, uh, they're being boosted from a previous uh, vaccination. And we know uh, which group uh, people are in because if they lack any titer or any uh, immunologic history to the nucleocapsid uh, protein, uh, we know that their previous exposure was from a vaccine uh, that doesn't have that component. Whereas if you're naturally exposed, your immune system can uh, has some evidence of all three uh, antigens. So. Uh, when we take a look uh, first at uh, the safety side of things, as Gordon mentioned, uh, there weren't big differences. Uh, but uh, going further, we can also tell that uh, over time, even if enrollees came in naive and had no exposure to either the vaccine or the virus, by the end of the six month period, uh, they had all had some exposure to uh, COVID 2 the actual virus itself. And we know that because the level of uh, uh, N changed. And so we can kind of measure that across. So uh, the first, as we look through the results, we can't simply write off that this group never saw a virus and therefore they had a distinctly different um, immunologic history, which would be important. Um, the second is the durability. And I wanna dwell on this a bit because this gets into um, uh, understanding the me mechanism perhaps in a way that we couldn't have uh, done otherwise. And, that, and what I mean by that is it would be unethical uh, for us to conduct a study where we vaccinate people and then subject them to exposure to dangerous viruses without uh, any idea as to whether or not that would help. Uh, but the, the trial gave us the opportunity to take a look. And what happened uh, quite clearly is uh, one specific uh, component, it was that long tail, that long, slow um, uh, fading of titers over time in uh, those who were treated versus placebo. And so how could that happen first, uh, rather than did it? So if we're confronted with it, it appears to, how? Well, 
Durability is actually a challenge. That long tail, that that uh, keeping uh, titers for a long time, it's a challenge not just with mRNA vaccines, but it's a challenge with coronaviruses. It's actually a challenge with many infections. And the reason why is shown pictographically on, on the left side of the screen, and that is uh, during infection, there's a, a rapid response that is mostly in your periphery where uh, brand new naive B cells are pulled into motion like a marine force that very, very quickly outside of germinal centers in what are called extra follicular um, uh, collections, they very quickly select antibodies that uh, engage with the antigen. And the idea there is that a rapid expansion of these cells uh, provides quick frontline support that can neutralize viruses. And evolutionarily, this would be very important. If it took a good two weeks every single time for uh, your immune system to finally select the perfect antibody, uh, you could be long since dead. And so this extra follicular uh, pathway is kind of the white hot response of the immune system. And it's also seen in people who get very severe cases of CoV-2. Now, the downside of this is that rapid response not only uh, leaves you with not the perfect, fully uh, idealized antibodies, but also uh, the antibody secreting cells at the end have a very short lifespan. And so they undergo uh, uh, apoptosis and, and die. And uh, again, this is something that is uh, a key phenomena that's uh, needed by your uh, immune system. Uh, in some viral infections, for instance, 70% uh, of your B cells in your periphery during infection might be all one type just to combat the infection. So clearly you have to cleave it afterwards. The problem with that is if the response is skewed so much in that direction that the pathway on the right side of that pictograph is neglected. And it is not known for sure, but it's suspected that it's actually shunted, where going through and having uh, this long, highly selective process uh, in the germinal centers where antigens are presented, B cells undergo somatic hypermutation, the perfect vintage of um, antibodies are made. And those cells not only secrete antibodies for the present infection, but they acquire epigenetic signaling and are able to go into long-term niches. And uh, some of those are uh, termed things like uh, long-lived plasma cells. And they go into places like tissues and your bone marrow. Now, uh, this, is, this is known, this is the known challenge. And so uh, the idea of overcoming a lack of durability uh, and having a long response is thought to be an immune engineering issue and actually an almost uh, uh, most likely an adjuvant issue. But by forcing long-term immunity, uh, the concern is always that you are also forcing longer periods that could expose people to symptoms, reactogenicity. And so, uh, it's it's very likely, it's plausible that you actually need multiple levers that not only inspire the immune system to undergo the right kind of immune response, but also that that is a controlled, regulated immune response that engages all of the normal levers that allow the immune system to back off after um, the antigen from a vaccine or the infectious agent or the pathogen uh, is is gone. And so. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, rush through now uh, because I don't want Paul's talk to be cut off, but uh, the reactogenicity also manifests itself as symptoms. And because we saw a decrease in symptoms, this actually leads to a very, very interesting concept. Uh, the first is that when mRNA vaccines were produced, while they were engineered to not engage uh, toll-like receptor 7 and 8 by modifying the uh, RNA, the liquid uh, uh, nanoparticles acted as a as an adjuvant. And in model mice, model mice are actually quite good at auto-regulating exposures to different antigens where they'll make things like interleukin-1, IL-6, and they also make interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. 
right along part and parcel, and that controls uh, hyperexpression and over uh, stimulation of the immune system. But humans don't. Uh, we're different, it turns out. And so it's been postulated and, and tried really in different ways to try and set up the human immune system baseline so that we're in the perfect spot to receive a vaccine where our immune system is neither too hot, too cold, the vaccine response can go through and you can get this long, durable response. And it has been extraordinarily difficult because you actually need multiple components. You need something that is going to both have a front end effect as well as keep that regulatory loop intact. But mycelia from mushrooms might actually thread that needle. And I say that because they elicit a response during uh, immune stimulation that also drags along the production of interleukin-1 receptor agonist. And in the case of mRNA vaccines and other liquid nanoparticle uh, vaccines, uh, this should be generally true. And if you can, at this time of vaccination, use adjuvants that not only inspire a good immune response, but also keep a healthy circuit of interleukin-1 receptor agonist, for instance, uh, in there, what you can get is everything you want. And that is a fulvent response, maturation of B cells, recall responses, yet enough interleukin-1 RA in this case to downregulate after the antigen exposure is over. And so uh, I'm gonna uh, now pass over to Paul, who's gonna talk about this some more. And I hope that in discussion, we can get into more details uh, as needed. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gordon and Stephen, and uh, all of you. I presume you can see my slides. Um, I'm gonna discuss the rationale and the ecology of how we came up with combining the mycelium uh, grown on rice uh, for uh, cultivation of agaricon and turkey tail. First, my disclosures, I do own a company. Um, I have co-founded a company called Mycomedica as well. That's more on the psilocybin and the pharmaceutical path. I've written multiple books. Um, and so my avocation and my vocation is one and the same. This is my life. I live, uh, drink, and breathe this. I want you to understand, if you don't already, that mycelium infuses all habitats with vast cellular networks. And occasionally, these networks produce a fruit body, a mushroom fruit body. So mushroom mycelium is virtually everywhere. And when you see it grow out, you can, mushrooms make mycelium, mycelium makes mushroom. A mushroom is made of compacted mycelium. So we call it hyphae. That's what all my mycologists describe mushrooms when they dissect them under the microscope, the type of hyphal or mycelial networks uh, that are created. The mycelium has many more genes that are activated. And just two examples, lion's mane and reishi, the mycelium has over 2,200 unique genes. Um, and the fruit bodies have 70. The intersection of those, you know, as you can see here. But as a general rule, and that makes sense, mycelium is run for years. A mushroom comes up, and most of them are perishable. They rot in four or five days. Mycelium is resident in direct contact with microbial um, adversaries uh, in the soil. So, of course, they'd have an intact immune system. We benefit from the immune system of mushroom mycelium. So Hippocrates first described Amadou as an anti-inflammatory. Um, and then Dioscorides first described, as far as we know, agaricon as an anti-inflammatory, both used as poultices, not being in, in, uh, ingested. So it's very interesting that, that Dioscorides described in the very first Materia Medica as agaricon as being elixirium ad longum vitam, the elixir of long life. Well, in the Pacific Northwest, where we are right now, uh, grave guardians, uh, the carvings were made from agaricon and placed on the graves of shamans to help them go into the afterlife. And moreover, it's also central to many of the myths of the indigenous peoples um, of this region. So this is where agaricon grows, in the old growth forests. There's less than 1% of the old growth forests remaining. This is so important that we think about the genomic reservoir of the old growth forest. It's a shrinking library of potential new strains that can help human health. Agaricon is very hard to uh, find sometimes. We have to go up hundreds of feet into a tree. 
And we take an agaricon can be very large. It's thought to be the longest living mushroom in the world. There's two other candidates for that. This one in the center is probably about 100 years of age. The tree on the left is the largest spruce in Canada. And the, the images on the right just gives you an idea how long I've been collecting agaricon ever since I was a young man. We try not to collect the fruit bodies. We take a small tissue clone um, and we get it into the culture. Um, it's really important that we preserve the, these fruit bodies. But if it's being logged or there's a fire or other types of devastation, we will go in and harvest the woodcocks out of the forest. We now have a vast library of agaricon strains. This year, we'll have 100 strains in culture. I cannot emphasize enough. My most valuable material possession in my life is this strain of these, this library of agaricon. If most of you know the story of Mary Hunt. In 1943, her moldy cantaloupe found in Peoria, Illinois, led to the strain of penicillin, penicillium that produced 200 times more penicillin than Alexander Fleming had discovered. Mycodiversity is important. We are looking for the super strain of agaricon. We already have preliminary in vitro evidence of several super strains in our library. So our intention is to do 100 strains, full genome sequencing, and we're going to look for these high-producing strains, which we think we can uh, be helpful for medicine. Now, agaricon grows is on the red list of threatened species in Europe, even though this looks like a vast territorial range. If you actually saw the individual collections made in the past 10 years, there are very few. More than 50% of the collections in the past 20 years have declined in terms of the ability to discover these. So I came to agaricon long ago. Uh, some of you know my work with BioShield uh, directly after 9-11, um, and numerous articles have been published on this. Um, one, there's an interview with myself and NPR and the director of the BioShield program talking about agaricon and being putatively active in vitro against uh, pox viruses. But it's not on us, you know, uh, Vector Institute in Russia also published numerous articles on agaricon mycelium being active against viruses, including flu viruses, H5N1. Now, because of my work with BioShield, I'm a beekeeper and a mushroom grower. So I thought, well, I wonder if these polypore mushrooms be active against reducing viruses, harming bees, calling colony collapse. Indeed it is. One treatment, 12 days later, 1% of our mycelial extract, put it into sugar water, reduced the deformed wing virus and Lake Sinai viruses massively. This article was published in Nature, Scientific Reports. It's in the top 0.1% of all articles ever published in the Nature Publication Ecosystem. Um, and I think it's a testimonial to the fact that a natural product could be more active than, a, a, than an antiviral drug. And indeed, 70% of all antiviral drugs can be traced um, from natural products. So this should be no new news. Nature is a vast reservoir, still a library of potential new medicines that we need to explore. We did biograded fractionation of agaricon with Scott Franzblau of the Tuberculosis Research Institute, and we found a chlorinated coumarin active against Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So agaricon is very interesting because it's antiviral and antibacterial, and obviously on bacterial infections oftentimes can follow viral infections. Now turkey tail is as rare as agaricon is, is as common turkey tail is. And as Christopher Hobbs mentioned, turkey tail is the most well-studied medicinal mushroom in the world. Uh, it's called versicolor because of variety in colors. Well, an article published in The Lancet as an adjunct therapy using PSK, which comes from the uh, turkey tail mycelium, shows an increase in the five-year disease-free survival rate of colorectal cancer or gastric cancer. And it's also as a prebiotic for the microbiome. But this is something, and I'm really glad we had a discussion on the potential dangers of beta-glucans. Because number one, beta glucans are long polymers. Um, and this group of scientists use lipases and they strip the uh, polyphenols and fatty acids from the, the beta glucans. Now, think of beta glucans as a scaffolding, it's a massive scaffolding, and decorated in that scaffolding is all sorts of other compounds. So, when lipases were used, it actually reduced the TLR2 agonist response of PSK by 83%. So I suggest to you, it's not the beta-glucans. Uh, it's these fatty acid and polyphenols and the scaffolding that's holding them. When you strip off the polyphenols, these fatty acids, you reduce uh, immune response. So now we published this, and this is really important. And um, thank you, Stephen, for mentioning it. We found that the mycelium grown on grain, 
and we published this, enhances up to 7,000% uh, and expressed in interleukin-1 RA and interleukin-10. These are anti-inflammatory cytokines. So I think there's a much bigger picture. I know the beta-glucans are the bright, shiny object on the Christmas tree of knowledge, um, but I think we should be lot, much more circumspect. Um, and it's also important that you know a beta-glucan analysis is fraught with error. It is, there is no validated a, AOAC, uh, the Agro, 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 Association of Organic Agricultural Chemists, uh, for beta-glucans. I challenge any of you, if you have beta-glucan samples, send it to three different laboratories. You'll get three different results, vastly different. So beta-glucans is really not, I think, the subject of the marker of interest that we should focus on. So the future goals are more clinical studies, dose escalation, of course, pairing the right vaccines with the antiviral species, the phenotypes. We have 100 strains of agaricon. More polypore should be you know, explored, for sure. The substrate uh, genomic expression variables cross animal species benefits. If we show this uptake this immunity that reduces viruses in bees, pigs, birds, humans, this could be an enormous breakthrough or a door to open to new potential treatments for understanding how we can mitigate the effects of pandemics. The crosstalk between receptors, something I'm very keen on. Um, other medicines to, to pair. And prophylactically, can agaricon and trochidero prevent infection? So I think we're looking at boosting community immunity. We create a bioshield of benefits that can limit the spread, the mutation, and va vaccine evasion of the many variants of, of these viruses that are present on the near event horizon. If all the, the articles I've showed you are at a great database that we populate called mushroomreferences.com. Um, it's over a thousand pages long. Um, it's non-branded, no advertising, just for, for doctors and physicians uh, and, and scientists. So thank you very much for your attention. That was great. Thank you so much.